welcome. It's Friday, it's eight o'clock, and that means it's time for Buster's Virtual Jazz Club. Yes, we're streaming live on YouTube around the world to infinity and beyond. So if you're out there, do say hello in the chat box. Oh, there's a couple already. Hi, Peter. Hi, Fran. Nice to see you. Good to know it's all working and you're receiving us loud and clear. Um, I hope you've had a great week and uh, before we start I'd just like to say a big thank you to all my regular patrons and uh, subscribe on Patreon and also to everybody who makes a donation on PayPal, it really means a lot and it's been a massive help this year. Um, don't forget to visit my website busterbirch.co.uk slash virtual jazz club, the links below, where you can watch all of the past shows and see who my upcoming guests will be. And I have to say a big special thank you to my new patron this week, Wendy Norman. Thank you, Wendy. Much appreciated. So on to tonight's show. It's a special one tonight because for the first time I have two guests for you. They're a great musical partnership who have worked tirelessly for many years to create, produce and promote new music. Individually, they are Deirdre Cartwright, who is a critically acclaimed guitarist and composer who won the public vote for guitar at the 2019 British Jazz Awards. She became well known presenting the BBC TV's groundbreaking series Rock School, which first aired in 1983 and had millions of viewers from all around the world. She was also a member of the Afro-Latin jazz group The Guest Stars, recording three albums and touring in 17 countries. In 1991, she formed the Deirdre Cartwright Group and released five albums of her own material. She has also written and recorded albums with other groups, including Emily Rem Remembered and Lund. She has performed with Tal Farlow, Jane Cortez, Donardo Coleman, Ray Davies, and toured with the Jamaican composer Marjorie Wiley, and also presented on Radio 4 Jazz Notes. More recently, she has written and recorded albums with the Alison Rayner Quintet, Picnic with Annie Whitehead, and Paint It Blue. She has published seven books on guitar playing and was head of the guitar syllabus for the Rock School exam series. She currently presents her own radio program on Jazz London Radio. My other guest, part of this uh, dynamic duo, is Alison Rayner, who is an award-winning double bass player and composer who has been playing jazz and contemporary music in a career of over 40 years. In November 2019, she won the Ivers Academy Composers Award for Small Jazz Ensemble with her com composition, There Is A Crack In Everything. In 2018, her quintet, the ARC, won Ensemble of the Year in the All-Party Parliamentary Jazz Awards and was shortlisted as Best Small Group in the British Jazz Awards, whilst also taking runner-up place in the Best Double Bassist category. She also was a member of the critically acclaimed jazz Latin supergroup The Guest Stars, touring major international jazz venues and festivals and recording three albums. She has played with jazz legends such as US guitarist Tal Farlow, New York jazz poet Jane Cortez and drummer Donato Coleman. She started her own band in 2012, ARC, whose profile has risen dramatically over the past few years with critical acclaim for their three albums, August, A Magic Life and Short Stories, with national and international radio play and four and five star reviews in the jazz and national press. But together, they are blow the fuse. Last year, they not only received the Parliamentary Jazz Award for Services to Jazz, but also celebrated 30 years of musical innovation and collaboration. Blow the Fuse have played a crucial role in raising awareness about women jazz musicians, and more importantly, giving them support, opportunities, and a platform to perform their own music. Blow the Fuse have been very much part of the new resurgence of jazz musicians, which contain many talented young women. Beginning in 2012, Blow the Fuse ran several seasons of concerts called Tomorrow the Moon, One Small Step for Women, which have featured groups led by emerging and established composers such as Laura Jurd, Yaz Ahmed, Laura Cole, Dee Byrne, Shirley Tetter, Lauren Kinsella, Ros Harding, Nikki Isles, Sharma Rahman, Daphna Sada, Flo Moore, Chelsea Carmichael, Camilla George and Nubia Garcia. Blow the Fuse have set up and managed many UK tours featuring new musical works, innovative collaborations and educational projects. They also run Blow the Fuse record label, producing different artists. And I'm pleased to say they're here with us now, live on YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the very wonderful Deirdre Cartwright and Alison Rayner. <laughs> Hello guys, how are you doing? Thank you for joining us. Hello. Nice to be here, Buster. Hi, I Ali. Feel, 
Uh, hello, I feel um, I feel exhausted after hearing that list of things that we've done because it doesn't really it doesn't really meet with my life now, which is mainly um, getting up and cooking meals. Actually. Well, it, it's amazing what you've done, and um, yeah, no, to read it all out, I was, I, I, I was almost saying, well, we've just got time for one record now, but. <laughs> It's incredible, you guys. I mean, I, first of all, thank you for being on the show. Uh, it, I'm really looking forward to featuring you and, and some of the things you've done and some of the different things that you've done. And it, it's quite remarkable that you've, you've just you've put so much time and effort and energy in over so many years, slogging away, just doing it, hitting the road, just, you know, in the, in the good old days when we didn't have the internet, when life was tougher to get these things going as well. And it's, it's, it's incredible feet of of just sheer will i think that's that you've that you've just achieved so much um so thank you in advance for all that <laughs> what i want what i would start with is though I, I i will say um i mean it's been a funny year hasn't it and i you know we know each other very well so that i'm asking questions here that i already know the answer to but i thought it would be good to share with the audience who may may not know and so it's been a funny year and we've all lost work, but, but you guys have lost quite a few things. And I, I just wonder if you wanted to talk a little bit about things that pl projects that you had planned. I know we had a, we had an hour, uh, a tour, several tours we've kind of had, had, had on the, had to sort of wrapped up, but you've been, you've been as ever, uh, you know, uh, innovative and come up with something that you've been working on recently as well. But perhaps we could just sort of talk about the, like the, what happened last year. We were in, the, well, in March last year, just when the lockdown happened, we were in the middle of two projects, really. One was my group, ARC. Um, we'd released the third album, Short Stories, in the autumn. Um, and we were midway through a tour. And we had loads of dates. In fact, we'd only just done the album launch at the Pizza Express. That was the end of February 2020. And we had, we did a few dates, uh, uh, regional dates uh, in the West Midlands and then there was a lockdown and everything from or well, from then onwards um, March April May right through we had some couple of festivals in July yeah. all of that got uh, well cancelled postponed I was able to reschedule some of these dates into this year and now they're starting to be postponed because of course when the lockdown started we thought oh it's going to be a couple of months we never imagined yeah. that a year later we'd be in yeah. exactly the, pretty much the same position um we were also Deirdre and i with our blow the fuse you mentioned buster the tomorrow the moon project and we'd also started um a tomorrow the moon season and i think we were halfway through that we had two or three really lovely dates um a lot of those are double bills and we featured um uh, we featured a oh a number of a number of musicians in that first first two or three dates, and it was all going swimmingly, and then that had to stop. So mm. that's there to be picked up at a later date. So yes, and then all sort of work, all the work we would have had for the rest of the year, of course, has gone. So it has, as you say, it's been a very it's been a difficult time, I suppose, really a very weird and difficult time. But we've tried to keep things going a bit in a different way. Well, you have, I know, and I think I think it's brilliant what you've been doing. So, uh, for the people, for the for the listeners, the viewers, um, you've you've been running these on air series, haven't you? Recently, which are um, Deirdre, perhaps you could tell us a bit about that. They're pre-recorded, but they go out live on particular dates. Is that right? Yeah, I think we've been running a jazz club since 1989, and so we're very used to having that regular slot, and we've built up right. a, a big audience throughout the years, and also from all the years of touring as well, so we have quite a following, and many of our, we, we, well, they're, not, they're not really fans of followers, a lot of them are our friends as well, mm -hmm. you know, over known people for such a long time, and I think we realised that when lockdown started, like you, Buster, we thought, is there any way in which we can run a kind of virtual jazz club still? Mm -hmm. And so we actually applied for some money from the Arts Council. And then we also crowdfunded as well, because mm -hmm. moving stuff online without an audience, it meant that we had to really kind of meet all our costs 
you know, without, you know, being able to put on live gigs and the cost was significantly more. We had an enormous learning curve finding it all out about, um, you know, live streaming mixers and cameras and things like that. And we, we kind of record that. So we, we went to the Vortex, what we've run for a long time. Mm. And um, we were able to use the cameras and the video editing equipment there. And we kind of record the gigs live and then but we put them out um a little bit later so they're recorded as live and uh it's been fantastic for some of the musicians we've put on it's the only gig that they've done the whole year and yeah. that shows uh-huh. you how gigs have been decimated and we've had such fun the days um and we still haven't finished doing all our recordings yet but the season's going really well and we've had such great feedback about what we've been doing it's not the same as live but given everything i think we love doing it and we still well, feel connected to our audience. Well, like everything you do, you've done a great job. I mean, the quality of the sound and the pitch and everything is absolutely first class. It's very, very professional production. And um, perhaps, you know, p- people might not have realised you mentioned, but you, you've, so at Blow the Fuse have had a long standing relationship with, with the Vortex Jazz Club, isn't it? And am I right? You've run a month, is it a monthly night there for many years? Is that, is that, is that, is that how you've done? So, we, Alison? we yeah. started. I think we started running at the old Vortex in yeah. 1993, maybe right. 94. And we, actually, for many years, um, we ran weekly. We, oh. we used to run weekly. I can hardly believe we did it now, but we did. <laughs> wow. um, and uh, we recorded an album. Even we we at one point we got a, a, a digital when DAP machines came out, you know, digital audio tape. We bought one and we stuck up a couple of mics. We sort of wired them up into the ceiling. We recorded a whole season of gigs and then made an album out of it. It was Brilliant. and yes, and then we eventually kind of ran monthly, and then we moved with the Vortex to the new place. So we ha- have, I mean, we go right back. David Mossman, we were great friends with David Mossman. Yeah, knew him really very well. sad. Yeah, to lose mm. David. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, like you said, Deirdre, just keeping that thing going, it's something, it's part of you, isn't it, you guys? This this thing of putting on these gigs and it's been such a part of your life as part from your own performing um, the running these events, running these gigs. I mean, people, it's not till you do it, is it? Because I've done a bit and people don't, musicians generally don't realise how much goes in before, you know, to put in on a gig before they come through the door that night, you know, and... Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I think, Buster, also that for a lot of musicians, um, you know, other people have neighbours, friends, they have go out for meals, they have parties, they have whatever. <clears throat> for musicians, we uh, a lot of our, contact, our contacts are through gigs. So when, mm. when I, we're putting on a gig at the Vortex, it's like we know we're going to know personally half the room. Mm. We've known people, you know, so it's a bit like a little event. And it's our social life as well, and not just with the audience with um, the musicians we're playing with. I mm. have so many wonderful friends in the musicians community, but mm. I don't go necessarily out with any of these people. It's more mm. like a mm. kind of, you know, working relationship. So I haven't seen, I think I've seen you once since the um, the beginning of lockdown, but we would usually yeah. see each other on a, a regular basis and you yeah, just yeah. catch up and it's social as well. Yeah, yeah. I think also, Deirdre, you just mentioned about when we put on, uh, our gigs and ha- sort of how we feel about it. I think we've always felt that, like you said, the people who are coming to see us play, a lot of them are friends because we've known them for so long. And I think we often, we always feel like we're, it's a bit like they're coming around our house. It's like they're <laughs> our friends, they're coming to see us or it's our party. <laughs> so we kind of feel like we're always giving a party and we, we want to welcome people and make them feel part of it because that's you know that's half of it isn't it it's it's the communication between us as Deirdre said the other musicians and all the people in the audience many of whom have been coming to see us for 30 40 years and they've sort of seen a lot of stuff and it's keeping that connection because that's what makes live music so special doesn't it well you do have this fantastic way of creating this sort of community of people and you've got some you've got some fantastic very, like you say, very loyal followers that become friends, and they're not just fans. And um, and I've and and you know that's through you nurturing and constantly putting on, and and they and and they've been a great support to you. I know because we always, whenever we play the vortex, it's always packed. But I've, what's impressed me is when we'll go halfway across the country and I'll, we'll play in the back of some 
pub or a village hall somewhere. And, and there's always I don't think I've I don't think I've ever done a gig with you where somebody's not come along that you know and oh hello how are you and then they'll and they and they'll sort of you know they're on your mailing list and it's this you have this sort of great way of making people feel welcome and feel part of it. And I think I think that's down to you. I think that's how you know it's the way you do it that makes that thing special. That sense of Community really is is all is the word I think. Of. Well, look, let's let's um, let's show a bit. So we've got a we've got a clip. So these gigs they go out um, uh, on your on your YouTube channel, right? You you premiere them and you and you sh you you showcase them. You launch them on a particular date, and they're about an hour long, are they? Like a like a proper full concert. And what we've got here is we've got a little clip. We've got one track, and this is from the um, Annie Whitehead um, concert. Um, and when did this one air? It was Roughly. Uh, this was in January, wasn't it? So this is very recent. Yeah, this yeah. month. Okay. And so if people want to see the whole thing, they can find this on your YouTube channel. Very easy to find. So this is a clip, ladies and gentlemen. This is. Um, this is Annie Whitehead on trombone and Did You Cartwright guitar, Alison Rayner bass, and the very wonderful Mr. Winston Clifford on the drums. And the tune is called X Factor. Here we go.
Yes, that was Annie Whitehead uh, with Blow the Fuse on Air, which are a series of live stream gigs. Um, we're going to hear another one a bit a bit later on with Leanne Carroll, and that featured my guests, Deirdre Cartwright and Alison Rainey. Before we go on, I've just got to say hello to a few people in the chat box. Nice to see a few of them there. David Stacey, my friend from all the way from California, tuning in. Nice to see you, David. Hope you're well. Steve Clark's not on the wine tonight because he's had his jab. Mary Paradlock. Hi, Mary. Nice to see you. Um, is that Laurie up there? And uh, yeah, hi, Laurie. Peter Gibbs, Peter Gore. Chris Hodgkins in the house. Hello, Chris. Hey. Nice to see you. Alan Peach. Adrian. Adrian Zolotuin. And Fran. Fran Rayner. Lovely to see you guys. Um, Thanks for joining us. Yes, so back to the show. Um, great. I mean, great job. You know, I, you know, I shouldn't be surprised because everything you do is great. But like, it's, you've done a really great job with the sound and the pictures and everything, and you get a real live feeling as well, don't you? I think you've really got that nice mix of of um, of doing it. So you play. So you're playing live. It's like you're playing. It's just that it's it, it's taped and then goes out afterwards. Yeah, good. So um, I think what we're going to do now is we go, we're going to go rewind a little bit, talk a bit about you know early early days and um, and we've we've got a, a nice a, a clip here, a very special clip of the, um, the guest stars and uh, live on TV, live TV back in the old days on the BBC. And so I just thought, Deirdre, do you want to do you want to tell us a little bit about this particular? Uh, uh, clip we're going to see because there's something interesting about the set isn't there as well oh yeah okay um well i think this is going right the way back to 1984 it was about six o'clock in the morning something weird like that and we were just about to go off on our tour of america and um I think because I'd done rock school, they decided that I was the leader of the band. There wasn't a leader of the band. The guest stars was just a, a totally collective arguing group, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> we actually got on well most of the time, pretty well, but there wasn't a leader as such. Um, but what was great is this is going back to the 1980s now, BBC. And yeah. uh, basically, um, this was the album that we had just released. The guest stars. That's our I'll very just first put it across album. a bit. Sorry, I've got you. I've got you. Um, Can you see that? Come back a little bit. Little bit back. Was that that's good? it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So we got this palm tree, and we this... Got this palm trees. And when we got to the studio at something like five o'clock in the morning, they had actually built a set based Amazing. on the cover of the album. 
just for our slot. We played two tunes actually. And um, and I always remember chatting to Selena Scott, who was a little bit of a kind of, she was very much a TV, well still is, a TV celebrity and star. And she was very, very chatty and just saying, oh, it's great to see you girls doing this and when you're going off and I'll just chat to you a little bit about what's going on. And I just stood there and she went, so, and you'll hear this actually, she said, so what made it good enough for you? And I just, it's done, I went, ah! and, I, and I just went, as you do, I thought, I oh my god! You, I hand, thought, you handle it brilliantly. You don't, you don't <laughs> skip a beat. You don't even blink. It's amazing. So she completely tried to stitch you up, basically. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah, yeah. yeah totally. At, at that <laughs> ungodly hour in the morning as well. Yes, yeah. Oh well. Well, and you I handled it very well. Also, that you'll see as well, it, the guest stars, you'll see Lackadaisical on piano and vocals, Linda Domango on the congas, Josephina Cupido on drums and Ruthie Smith on saxophone vocals, and of course, Alison and myself playing. And this is a piece written by Alison. Alison's piece, yeah. I mean, I mean, a lot of people will know the guest stars, especially if, it, uh, I mean, imagine quite a few of your, your um, fans are tuned in tonight. But for those that don't, I mean, this was, this was an extraordinary band. I mean, they, it's a great band. I, I, love, I love the playing and every, all fantastic, amazing musicians. But you had a great sound as a band. It's very contemporary, very hip, um, and, but still had a lot. It's, it's funky and it was, you know, it's just great music. A, a little touch of, I don't know, maybe you don't like those compa comparisons, but Alison, your your bass is amazing. You you sound like Jack Pistorius on there. You're playing this, you're playing this fretless bass, right? And I know he was a he was a bit of a hero of yours at the time, right? So maybe there was, was an influence there. Yes, well, but the whole band has got like a bit of a weather report sound to me. Maybe it's this track because uh, Ruthie's playing this soprano. She's got a kind of little touch of the Wayne Shorter there, and then it's a, but not that at all. You're doing a cover or anything like that. I just it's just just the kind of sound world, you know, in terms it of things. A, it was a it was a band that was full of different dif different music yeah. influences. Yeah, uh, and and yes, I mean I loved. Um, Jack of Pastoris and Weather Report, but just as much we'd have, uh, we had pieces that were we had we had a cappella pieces that were extremely gospelly. Yeah, um, Ruthie had played quite a lot of free jazz, and uh, there was a big um, African sort of South African influence. Right. Again, people knew and played with South African musicians, Latin music, and um, Linda Linda's I, fantastic on the congas, and I've said this before about her. She has a particular, but there's a particular sound, a style to her plan, I think, which is much more African, because I've it. played a bit of congas, and like most people that play congas like that over here, they tend to go. It's a there's a whole Cuban thing of congas, right, which is a great tradition. But there's this other, there's another way, another sound, another style of conga plan, which is much more rooted in the African. Yes. Uh, style and sound and she's kind of really got that sound hasn't she when she it's... when she started playing um really it was because she got to know a lot of she was interested in playing and in music she 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 met a lot of african musicians right. um and she used to hang out with them and she right. actually said we saw an interview where she said um well i had a choice of just sitting there or i could make the tea or i could join in and she said <laughs> well, i think i'll join in yeah. and so her, i think that was her influence was very much african music but we all had these really strong influences and yeah somehow it worked you'd think on paper you'd think oh that sounds like a nightmare but it wasn't it was fantastic and the group ah. also mm. it was a very like deirdre said it was a cooperative and we worked really collaboratively for many years for, for a good two two or three years we rehearsed when we weren't away on tour and we were away a lot but when we weren't away on tour we'd rehearse two or three days a week because we didn't do anything else and we were able to pay ourselves these minimal wages so it was a bit like signing on money or something mm. but we managed on it for years and we weren't in any other bands and mm. we it was like our full-time thing we'd mm. rehearse three days a week and we'd work on new material so anybody brought a tune along everybody would get involved and, mm. and suggest things so it, it was fantastic actually it was really exciting but i mean it must i mean you must have had so much like i can't imagine how frustrating some situations must have been for you because all right it's, a, it's all female but what's that got to, you know like it's not a gimmick band is it this is a serious the you're all serious great musicians and it's a great band that, you, that you've put so much time and work into and you're playing like really great original music really really well and yet i 
you must have had i mean early 80s come on you must have had to put up with a lot of bullshit quite frankly so like i was going to say not about that buster i was going to say something else which was yes we had an awful lot to contend with but <laughs> when you mentioned about uh jaco pastorius we were just on that television show we were just about to fly off to america and uh, and one of the highlights was going to seventh avenue south Alison and I, I don't think, I think it was just you and me, Ali. We went to 7th Avenue South and there was Jacko playing with his group in this small club about the size of the Vortex. And we were just standing there. It was amazing. And you went and talked to him afterwards and he, you were going to have a lesson with him. You put his, he, he wrote his number and phone number for you on a paper amazing. bag. Do you remember yeah. that? And you guys, I mean, you did, you toured the world. You, did, you went to America. You were, the, you were the first British band to headline at Ronnie Scott's. You toured... The Middle East, you went to behind the Iron Curtain, East Germany, you went to Russia, was it? You went to, no, no, not Russia, East Germany, sorry. And like literally, these are the days of you get in the van and go there and you had to sort all the paperwork out and there was no internet. And, and of course, we should mention Turkey. We toured in Greece and Turkey in our van, yes. <laughs> Unbelievable. And of course, we should mention your other member of your band, it was your very brilliant manager, Debbie, who, who just was, was just a force of nature, wasn't she? And, and she just you you and I just have so much admiration for you guys to, to be to be I mean to do that at any anywhere at any time is hard to but to do it then and to to have all that to put up with when you turn up as well I mean it, it must have just it been was amazing very because when we went to East Germany we played in places like Karl Markstadt and so when you said Russia I mean East Germany was very much from right curtain. that's why I was thinking Russia yeah, well, we yeah. played in one place where we played in the middle of what was the factory grounds and the entire village they hadn't had a live event for 20 years and we were advertised as an all-girl band from London and they were so excited <laughs> because they thought that we would get Banana arm across with the exactly. They can exactly. sort of disco pop music, and of course we come on playing jazz, and you could see the faces after the second number. They go, oh, you know, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. Off, the, off the town, just sort of very slowly left, you know, like oh. this. Whereas we played in um, Egypt, in Cairo, in the university there. And we were kind of, the boys were just coming closer and closer and closer to them, just standing yeah. right by us on the stage. And they were almost hysterical, you know, at seeing these women playing instruments. And they were just kind of, you know, it was extraordinary, you know, it was this incredible energy. And we didn't have any, you know, roadies or any, any security or anything like that. It was okay. But, you know, yeah. you could just feel like this incredible impact that we had on audience. And, and that was partly sometimes because of being women, I think, in certain countries. Well, you, you yeah. were cultural ambassadors. You were cultural ambassadors. You, you know, you went to these places and you did it all on your own with literally no help from anyone, no funding, nothing at all. It's incredible. You played the Blue Note in New York City. I mean, we should like... Anyway, I, um, well, look, let's <laughs> let's see. And of course, you were on BBC Good Morning TV at, uh, at the ungodly hour of about whenever it is. You'll see there's a little clock in the window, I think. But of course, you have to get there many hours before you actually broadcast, don't you? So let's watch this. And this is live. This is live TV going out live. And it's a little bit crackly. We've got a VHS tape kind of thing. Now, also, we should tell people to watch out for the little guest appearance at the end when they cut back to the... <laughs> When well, they cut back to the the uh, sofa, it's so exciting to see somebody smoking a cigar. Smoking a big fat cigar. And then you realise it's Peter Ustinov. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Here we are then. This is Tin Can Alley, and this is the guest stars live on morning TV from 1984, I think. Yeah. Here we go. And meet our guest girl jazz group who are set to take America by storm. The guest stars are an all-girl jazz band fast making a name for themselves in the pub and club circuit. Well, they've just released their first album, and now they're taking on the ultimate challenge for any jazz band, a tour of America, the birthplace of jazz. Deirdre Cartwright is going with her group. Why no men? Why aren't men good enough for you? Oh, they're good enough for us, but uh, I think because we've, we've started off, actually, as a, a mixed group, you know, having men guesting, and then gradually 
we discovered that the people that uh, we felt most comfortable and the happiest playing with were women. And so it started off as a mixed group and it eventually just became a women's band. You're starting to make a name for yourself, as I said, on the pub and club circuit, and now you're about to take yourself off to America. Why so soon? Well, um, I think we've been going now for about a couple of years. Um, I think it's because we've just released an album and that gave us the um, idea of perhaps we could get some gigs in America. We sent over some copies and there was quite a good reaction. And um, we've managed to sort of set up. And as you say, it's a challenge for any group and it was a challenge for us. So we decided we'd like to, to try and take it up. Well, managed to sort of set it up, I think, is an understatement <laughs> because you worked very hard indeed, haven't you? And you're going to be paying your way around there. You're really doing it the hard way. Yes. Let's let's listen to your to one of your songs okay, off yes. your new album. Which one's right. it going to be? Um, we're going to start with Tin Can Alley. Right, I'll leave you to it. Okay. And, uh, let's let's hear it. We told you they were good. They're called the guest stars. They're just off on a tour of the States. I hope you're enjoying the show. I just want to take a moment to tell you about um, a new way that you can help support me do this, and that is through patreon.com. That's right, I've got a, an account now, so the link's below here patreon.com Buster Birch. And if you go along to there, um, you can now make donations by Visa credit card, so you don't have to use PayPal if you don't want to do that. And the advantage of Patreon is that once you do it once, it will automatically deduct on a per show basis. So instead of having to fill in the forms every week, if you want to make a regular donation, then that will just automatically deduct straight to your credit card each per show. And that is hugely helpful to me because it means I know that I've got certain amount coming in every time I do a show, and that really helps me uh, plan ahead and keeps the viable sustainability of the show going. There's two levels of sponsorship. There's my silver and gold membership. All of my patron supporters will get a 
big thank you personally from me live on the show and to the gold uh, member sponsors will get an additional uh, Spotify playlist which uh, will be sent to you each week it's something that I'm putting together it's personally curated by me and will feature lots more albums by the by the guest artists each week so it's a great opportunity to get to know this music much better if you're if you're really enjoying the show and you like the little uh, tasters that you're hearing that's a great way to get to know this music even more and enjoy uh, in full comfort the full sound of the full albums thanks very much back to the show Yes, welcome back. Uh, my guests are Deirdre Carr and Alison Rayner, who run the Blow the Fuse uh, collective um, of uh, of producing gigs and albums and bands and all sorts of things they do. So yeah, that was um, that must have been a lot of fun and what a great band. And yeah, you, you had a lot of great times, I know, because we've often talked about it. And we should mention, of course, that the band um, got together for a reunion recently for we i'm losing track of time but it was the 2019 london jazz festival mm. king's place did a big concert big concert hall there and that was that was a lovely night wasn't it we great and i remember yeah. i brought along all the kids from my little jazz school and they all came along and i remember saying right we'll check these guys out It'd be very and you know there was and then you had again again you gave and you gave a platform to some young um up and coming uh, uh women musicians even on that stage, and I thought that was really generous of you to do that. And and I think the ripples of what you're doing uh, uh, and have done over the years are really important, isn't it? Because well, there's nothing more inspiring than seeing someone do it. Do you know what I mean? Like to make something, to, to feel like, oh, it can be done, I could do this. They're doing it, look at them, they're doing it. You know, you've led by doing it, which is very powerful, I think. You've broken the barriers down for the other people to come that, you? that thing the thing you say there about yes yeah, seeing people doing it's funny enough that's in a way the whole way the whole way we started blow the fuse is sort of a little bit of that in that um after the guest stars the guest stars carried on till about 19 88 88 89 and gradually the group kind of split people left and stuff um and uh Deirdre and I both, um, I'll just speak for you as well, Deirdre, we both, uh, well, I think we all felt, you know, we'd left the guest stars, been in a touring band for five years. We thought, well, this would be great. The phone's going to ring and we're going to get offered all kinds of things. And guess <laughs> what? The phone didn't ring. And um, it was um, a bit dire. Um, we found ourselves doing uh, bits of odd jobs and decorating and things like that. Oh, dear, yeah. um, and uh, on one occasion, um, we were um, we were at somebody's house and we were putting in ceiling lights into some were they spotlights I can't quite remember but I think they might have <laughs> and we were wearing our overalls and Deirdre was up the ladder and she had a screwdriver in the air and she's sort of going and she suddenly looked at me and she burst into tears and she said I don't know what's happened I thought I was a guitarist <laughs> <laughs> anyway shortly after that oh. I went to New York and um, one of the guitarists, well, I liked too, did you like very much was Mike Stern. And, and right. we'd seen him play, of course, here at big festivals and concert halls. And um, he was on playing, he, I, we realized that he, I realized that he does, uh, he was doing a regular gig at 55 Bar, which is a really small jazz club in Greenwich Village. And I went along and it was fantastic, you know, and he does like two shows a night. And I thought, this is incredible. I came back and I've record, I recorded the gig, of course, on my cassette player under the table, as one always did. And <laughs> when I came back, I gave Deirdre the tape to hear, and she loved my stern anyway. And she said, oh, my God, she said, oh, this is great. We could do this. We could, we could, have, we could have a jazz, we could put on jazz nights and ask people to come and play with us, because everybody wants a gig. And, of course, that's what we wanted. We wanted a gig. So that's how we came to start Blow the Fuse. And the Vortex Jazz Club was just around the corner here. And so anyway, we actually started the, the, the um, started Blow the Fuse at another venue. But, it, you know, in small pubs and little places locally. And that's how we started doing it and asking people to play. Amazing. And then around, not long after that, I had, a, I actually had a quartet for a couple of years um, that I started with, with Deirdre and with, um, Roger Beaujolais on Vibes, 
Mm. And he's been on this show actually. He was one of my guests. Yeah, so yeah, he's fantastic. Mm. Uh, he when we were in the guest stars, he was in the um, what was that band? The Chevalier Brothers. Chevalier Brothers. Yeah, we and played the we track. Were a track. We were yeah. on slightly different circuit, but yeah. we knew each other through that because we were both out doing lots yeah. of touring and stuff. He was on Ted Rogers Three Two One. Was he? <laughs> yeah, we played a clip. That. That's yeah, you, you, that's the different circuits you were on. Yeah, you yeah, were on the BBC. Was he was on the that. ITV. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I'd be silly. Uh, yeah, and it was uh, we had. I think I had uh, Cheryl Allen initially played drums, right. and then mm. later on it was Simon Pearson. So anyway, yeah. that was a very nice group. Um, we made a couple of cassettes, but we didn't. It was in that funny interim period. I think I don't know whether CDs were sort of was sort of in between the vinyl and CD era, really. Mm. And that sort of I I only managed to do that for a couple of years. That kind of faded out a bit, and then short. And then Deirdre started. Uh, her own band, her own quintet, and we both are in, have been in each other's bands, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, and initially had a band with Louise Elliott and Gary Hammond, and um, she had two or three lineups. I mean, did you do say some more if you want about that? And you, um, I, th I think we you had made a few albums, didn't you? And they're yeah. slightly different and then lineups. There was a letter group later, which had um, Jeanette Mason and Corolla Gray on drums. Anyway, but then, and I suppose I should leave you, Deirdre, to just talk a bit about what's coming up. Well, I was going to say, it's going to feature the three of us, the next track. Yes. And that's, that's because right. Alison and Buster met on the Jazz Summer School, yeah. didn't you? Yes. And then Alison introduced me to Buster and we began doing some gigs together. And I really yeah. liked your playing. And oh, so was. we ended up doing um, a couple of years where we were playing and then Mark Doffman from the Spin Club, who runs, we, we know him from one of the Spin Club now, he's a drummer, who actually guested with the guest stars years oh, ago. I didn't know that. Mm. Okay, right back to, yes, Mark. Um, Mark was doing a PhD and he was uh, wanted to um, explore rhythms. And part of that was he was uh, recording gigs and he recorded a gig uh, and we came to, we were playing the Vortex, and mm -hmm. Mark came along with Andy McGuinness, uh, you know, to record this gig and uh, for as part of his PhD. And then he sent me the tape afterwards, and I was listening to it uh, at home, and I thought, wow, this was a great night, and there's some great playing on here. Mm. So I rang Mark up, and I said, hey, Mark, I said, have you, what format have you got this on? We had the Masters. So I said, I, I, I think I'd like to release this as an album. And uh, which we did. It was called uh, Tune Up, Turn No. Tune Up, Tune Turn up, On, turn Stretch on, Out. Stretch Out. Chutoso, yeah, that was it. Yeah. And um, the track you're going to hear, this is very interesting because I'd done quite a lot of work with the Princess Trust teaching in the 90s, and I'd also been involved with Rock School as well, uh, Rock School exam series. And so I worked almost exclusively with teenage boys um, in rock bands. Mm -hmm. And so I had an incredible working knowledge of kind of uh, the grunge movement and uh, <laughs> the Manchester movement, you know, Oasis and um, Stone yeah. Roses and all this yeah. kind of repertoire. Um, and anyway, like many jazz musicians, I thought, what would happen if I took a sequence from a tune like Charlie Parker, um, <laughs> but not, <laughs> and write another tune on it? Yeah. And so... This is actually based on a very well-known Nirvana track, uh, and I called it Smells Like Jazz. And <laughs> when you were saying, you know, choose a couple of tracks for this program, when I heard this album by chance recently, I was just amazed at your drum solo on this buster. And oh. I said to you, have, did you have a double bass drum pedal? Because Me? I, no, I, I've... <laughs> No, no, I've never used the double bass. If, if, anyone, if you listen to this track, if this is coming, if you listen to the track and we're really <laughs> rocking out on it, so it just shows another side of us. Yeah. But you at the end go like, you're like Animal and the Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> you but yeah. you're playing a jazz kit. You've got a single bass drum pedal. There's nothing, yeah. you know, Carl Palmer about it at all, mm. but... It sounds amazing. So oh well, thank you. It's very kind. Smells uh, like jazz. I yeah. remember this gig actually. It was great. It was at the we, so this was so so just to uh, just to back up a little bit. So we we played together. We'd done a you know quite a bit of a few gigs. We'd done some tours. And what what you're going to see in here, folks, is some 
is some very some very um, nice pictures of us uh, from, from from a few years ago. So this is around about two thousand and six, and you'll notice something different about me when you see it. Um, and uh, there's um, we did a few tours. We went down to Cornwall. There's some pictures from that tour down to St Ives. We played a bunch of gigs. We played at the QEH. Um, uh, uh, at the uh, in the foyer there when they had a sort of big festival there's some pictures from there there's some pictures from i remember one of the gigs was in the gardens outside Ch what's that little park at charing cross victoria bankman victoria bankman victoria bankman and they've got a lovely um sort of bandstand there haven't they and it was in the summer and so there's a there's a the pictures are from a from a bunch of gigs we've done together but I, this i like i like it because um because um, I've got a lot less hair, and Deirdre <laughs> and you, Buster, have a lot more. I've got a lot more, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I looked at it and I was like, crikey, look at that, that's, that's amazing, yeah, yeah. Um, but the, the, uh, so the, but the, but the, but the album was from a gig, it's a lot, this is a live recording from a gig that we did at the Vortex, and I've got it here, and this was from November, 12th of November, 2006, and wow. uh, so, yeah. And this is uh, so. This is the three of us, but under the under the heading of the Gear, the Deirdre Cartwright Group, and um, this is smells like jazz. Here we go. <laughs>
Yeah, I remember that. It was good fun. I just said it sounded like canned clapping at the end there, but it wasn't. It was real, that, wasn't it? That was the gig yeah. on, from the gig. Yeah. Yeah, great fun. Yeah, I remember that gig. And uh, and looking at some of those. You can't, so you can't see the pictures, but you'll see them afterwards. And uh, there was some great, some great memories there. Very good, good, good fun, good times. And I, we were just saying, I, I, the other thing is, I, th I thought with well, that shirt, it, sounds, it always had a very full sound. And I think that's because, you know, as you said, we're using the, there was a lot of dynamics, but a lot of changes in texture as well. So, did you, when you use your pedals to get different sounds, it didn't, it sounded like more than three people, didn't it? I, I don't know. And, and there's always, and it was always, a, there was quite a lot of interplay between us. It seemed to, uh, I don't know. I don't, know, I don't know what I'm saying really, but it's just it, there was it was always fun to play. It was always interesting, but it yeah. had a bigger. I thought it had a big sound for a trio. Yeah, like, I think I I don't use pedals as quite as much as I did. I often just yeah. play the guitar straight into the amp, you know, and I'm yeah. very happy with that. But I think for that group, I probably had you know the wah wah pedal, a bit of distortion, um, hmm. volume pedal would be there, um, a little bit of delay. And also, I was doing a little bit of early didgeridoo guitar, I think. I yeah. love that interplay bit between you and Alison Buster. But it's this lovely mm. thing, and that you hear the guitar going, gang, 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 gang. That's the guitar scraping along the strings, you know. I love all that, all the different it's, sounds you can get out of the guitar. It's funny that it was, that was actually double bass, wasn't it? I was playing double bass there. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. there was a funny thing in that recording, wasn't there, Deirdre? Not on that tune. I think that was properly recorded, but something happened during the recording of the album where we realized when you were listening through to the recording, something at some point, the mic that was on the double bass actually dropped out. And on oh. part of the album, the bass is, I think recorded on one of the drum mics or something. Wow. Yeah. It's quite bizarre. The sound of the drum, the sound of the bass probably just coming through the amp and being picked up on the, on the, uh, yeah. the drum mics, but it worked fine. On That's that, Chris, was, isn't it? Chris, Chris fixed, probably fixed it, didn't he? He's probably great. Did, yeah. yeah. Chris right. Lewis. Yeah, Chris Lewis. Yeah, big up to Chris Lewis. Great sound engineer. Um, yeah, yeah, it was good fun. Yeah, yeah. It was always interesting. I mean, it could, I think also because we did play together quite a lot. I've got this thing, and it comes up quite a lot in the show about about how jazz. Um, when you play jazz, you kind of you got to get along with people, you know. And the better you know people, and the more time you spend together, particularly on the road, I think you really bond, don't you, when you go on the road as a band. You know, it's the touring and the hanging out and the hotel, you know, and just that the time you spend together, you get to know each other. And there's a sort of tr somebody said trust is the word really. And then what happens is when you reach that point, you've done a lot of gigs and you know each other and you you get along well, you know. But you can explore things much more. You can stretch it and and as the album says, stretch out. And I think that because we're not essentially we're not playing a, a fixed part, are we? We're creating the part. We have a clear structure, but that even that can evolve over a tour. A tune can change quite a lot, can't it? So the people that hear the Friday night version is is quite different to the Monday night. It could be another whole five choruses on there, you know. So <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's interesting though, isn't it? I think I think for me that's quite a significant difference about playing jazz. Mm. And I think that's why it's so important that people get along. I mean, famously, you could do a West End show and there's people there that have sat next to each other for 20 years and they don't speak to each other, you know. <laughs> and yet they just play the music. It doesn't matter, does it? But you just couldn't do that with jazz, could you? You, you just, it wouldn't, just cut, it can't work. You have to, and I think when you have that closeness with, on a personal level, then, then the music is better for it, I think. I don't know, just a theory. You think? I, I agree with you, Buster, and I think of, often I work in that space. Even though I can, I, I, I'm, I'm one of these musicians who, even though I played piano when I was young, and so I learned to read music, I'm not a, re I'm not naturally drawn to reading music. I almost had to sort of really push myself to learn to uh, read music better on the guitar and to be able to write it because of, you know. Partly because of wanting to write pieces and communicate with musicians, but partly because of doing the teaching and things like that. But I'm mm. much more an improviser than, a, than somebody who likes dots. And when I'm learning a tune, I like to come away from the music as soon as I'm able to, because mm. it takes too much of a certain part of my brain. I just like to be in that zone where I'm really listening to what people are doing and, and engage with the other musicians. And then the music just kind of can move. You've got a framework, 
and then the music and the, created by the musicians just mm. moves around it mm. and i think that's the magic of jazz really in a way mm. Mm. yeah very interesting Fantastic. Well, um, the time's pushing on, so we've got we've got two more things to play. So um, we've got a couple of videos. We're going to play. We're going to play another "Blow the Fuse" on air clip, featuring uh, the wonderful Leanne Carroll. So, and but um, she's somebody that again you've had a quite a long musical r relationship with. You've known for a very long time. Worked with for you know from from way back. It's not somebody that just sort of popped in for this one gig, is it? And I and again, I think that shows when because well as we'll see you know you, when you're playing together there's a there's a real genuine warmth there i think that comes across lovely in this clip and so when did you first work with leanne was, and, and and um how did that come about i actually don't remember what did she come to did she play at the duke of wellington or was it the vortex do you know the very first venue that we ever worked uh, the very first venue that blow the fuse uh, ran a club at was at the theater of the duke of wellington on the balls pond road in london hmm. and playing in the bar was ian shaw with a yeah. guitarist and that's how i met the wonderful vocalist ian shaw yeah and yeah. then he I played with him on a few gigs and whatever, and he told me about this great singer called Leanne Carroll. He said, oh, you've got to check out Leanne Carroll. And we're talking about 1989, 1990s, so quite a long time ago. Yeah. And um, I met or saw Leanne, and we asked her, we were doing a gig over in Brentford at the Waterman Arts Centre, and, the, and they had a piano, and she was a great piano player as well. So we asked her to come over. And so she used to come over regularly as our guest and play at the Waterman Arts Centre with us. So we've, and then she invited us down. She and Roger used to run a club, little club down in Hastings. Hastings, yeah. And that's Alice it. and I went down there a couple of times and we played at her club. And right. again, this would be early 90s, I think. So yeah. our association goes back a long way. She's on the very first guest star, um, very first Blurry Fused album as well. She was one of the guests. And, and funnily enough, um, she did my friend valentine which we start this we're not going to do this hear this track now but we did start the set with that one so yeah but we haven't worked with her for a long time and of course she's 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 become very well known abroad in new york and she plays oh, Molly star. yeah 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 and yeah. she's just one of the most phenomenal musicians i think on the british jazz scene and mm. she just music just comes out of her and if if anybody goes to hear yeah. that set um, after your show, Buster, and listen to the whole on air set. She does a wonderful version of um, she does Alfie, and um, oh. I remember Winston and I just said, "Oh, what else shall I do? Shall I do another number?" And Winston and I both said, "Could you do Alfie?" And she went, "Oh, yeah, hold on, let me just think if I remember the words." And then she just sat down and just did that version of Alfie. No mm. rehearsal, no. That yeah. was it. Amazing. And I just thought, my goodness, what a wonderful musician she is i think i think in a way starting we were just talking earlier about her starting blow the fuse it gave us the opportunity to meet and play with so many other fantastic musicians um when because we'd been away touring in the guest stars for years when we when we decided to start blow the fuse of course it's a it was wonderful for us i mean the main thing was we wanted to play but also what it meant was we could offer gigs to people. And of course, everybody loves to be asked to play. You know, everybody yeah. wants a gig. Yeah. Yeah. And um, as Deirdre mentioned, we, yeah, we had friends. It was friends of ours who ran that pub, the Duke of Wellington. And this theatre, it was a little theatre in the back. And they said, oh, yeah, we could have it on or whatever night of the week it was, a Wednesday or Thursday or something. And um, we had so many, we had amazing people come and play with us. I mean, um, we had um, Peter King, saxoph saxophonist Peter King played. Sarah wow. Jane Morris brought a band down mm -hmm. and the place was absolutely rammed. There were people sort of crammed in the doorway trying to get in from the street. And we had uh, Mike and Kate Westbrook came and played there. And it was um, wonderful. Jim Mullen. Jim Mullen. Jim Mullen, that's wow. right. Yeah, I yeah. love that. One of my heroes, Jim Mullen. Uh, yeah. yeah, he's mega, isn't Other he? Other guitarist, yeah. probably John Etheridge. Yeah. Mm -hmm played and then we had people like ed jones and oh all sorts of people and then when um they i think they left the pub or we whatever we moved on and 
then we, we, we worked in a couple of other places, but then we got settled in a bit at the Vortex. But it was, um, yeah, it was amazing to be able to have, you know, build up relationships with people and to know people for so long. And when we played with Leanne at this uh, number you're going to see, we haven't played with her for quite a while, have we? Because she's, you know, like we were saying, she's she's really on a, you know, pretty sort of a, a amazing circuit and plays abroad a lot. And so it was really lovely to be able to play mm. again. And um, uh, that was that was one that wasn't done with very much rehearsal. Was it? <laughs> well, don't, don't need it, do you? When you've got that quality of musicians all around, including you it's guys. Uh, and of course... Um, uh, Winston's with you on this one again, isn't he? He's an absolutely wonderful drummer. I love his playing. So um, let's listen to a bit of this. This is a track called Nobody's Fault But My Own, featuring Leanne Carroll. And again, folks, if you want to see the entire concert, you can do. It's all on there. Um, just check the links below. Blow the fuse, and that'll take you through to your... I think you've got a, you've got your own YouTube channel, haven't you? And um, all the concerts are on there. Here we go, then. This is Leanne Carroll. Nobody's fault but mine Nobody's fault but mine And if I die on my soul is lost Ain't nobody's fault but mine Yeah, mine I had a mama Oh, she could sing I had a mother She could sing it If I die And my soul is lost Ain't hey, nobody's fault but mine Do -do And I had a daddy A 
Yeah, Leanne Carroll there, featured on the Blow the Fuse on air uh, live stream, which is uh, uh, the view again. If you want to see the full stream, you can see that on uh, on the Blow the Fuse YouTube page. So do check that out. Well, the time's gone, and we've just got um, we've just got time to uh, say our goodbye. Well, we're just going to talk about this next uh, um, uh, project, next band, next track. We've got we're going to play out with a video, but um, but uh, yeah, there's somebody just sent a. Yeah, Fran's really impressed with uh, Leanne's singing. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, so the um, the uh, the the Ark band. So Alison, you you having played for many years uh, bass in, in all these bands, and um, and and did you 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 had your group for a while that Alison was in, and I was a, a very happy to be in as well. And we had the trio, and then Alison, you decided to to run your to put yourself. A little bit more further forward in the uh, in the band, and 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 we and we have um, the Alison Rayner Quintet now, often more 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 uh, commonly known as Ark. Yeah, so, I yeah I just wanted to, I'd I'd written um, I mean right. Deirdre's bands I played in various um, versions of her band, and there was always a space for me to write in that band. It was all, it was all right, pretty yeah. much all original material, and Deirdre of course wrote most of it. But she's always was always very keen for uh, you know for me to write if I wanted to contribute a piece or two, and that was great. But I'd always I'd had this feeling I'd written for other bands as well. Well, I mean, right back from the guest stars. But I had this idea that I'd really like my own group, just because you kind of create the sound more yourself. Um, so yes, and uh, I we've had the group now for about I can't think quite how long five or six years is it? Do you think? So we should mention also that so the other two members of the band, Steve Lodder and Diane McLaughlin, and then the, and the three of us. That's Ark. Um, but you had very long-standing uh, musical relationships with Steve and Diane as well. And you, they, you, there'd been lots yes. of playing and yeah. lots of different lineups and bands. And so you kind of you kind of knew who you wanted in the band before you did the band. Am I right? And that was definitely. Was, no, yeah. I did, and I definitely wanted. And then you couldn't find a drummer, and you went through about half a dozen, and then you are. <laughs> no, I, no, I he'll, remember. <laughs> he'll do. He'll do. Yeah, yeah. He's cheap. Yeah. Um, no, I remember. So, so you kind of had this in mind for a little while before you put it together. This, you kind of put put us all together, didn't you? Uh, mm-hmm. And then you had these tunes that you'd written, and it's it's yeah. been great fun, hasn't it? And Deirdre, I suppose for you as well, it's quite nice just playing and not having quite so much of that pressure of, of like running th- well you, you know still like, are involved yeah, aren't you, you? you can see your name you know you can see your name as your band but often what that really means is that you're doing a lot of the kind of admin yeah. work and and keeping the band together and all the rest of it and i think yeah. alison does a fantastic job uh, doing all that really i was so pleased when she asked me i mean we worked together for years but i did think oh i wonder if she'll ask me for her new band and luckily <laughs> she decided to do arq the quintet not the quartet which is uh, very good and also the track we're going to hear this you've done three albums but it's very interesting or this comes from august Sally, doesn't it but, yeah um, this this but, tune is from the first album hmm. well Go i was on. just going to say before we get to this tune i mean like the band i th- i think the band's really evolved over that time we've grown oh. into it haven't we although we're you know we're all experienced players and we've all We've all, I mean, I think I'm, I've played the least amount of time with you and, and, and that's, we're getting on for sort of like a couple of decades now, aren't we? So it's a, it's a quite, so there's long established musical relationships, but when you put that combination together, it takes a little while for that combination to find its sound. And, and we do have a lot of influences, a lot of things, but I, but I think there's a sound, there's a sound to this band that is, that is its own. And I think that's one of the strengths of it. I was I was very I was very keen to have a band that wasn't a, really a debt situation. There's been yeah. a couple of times when I've had to have a debt, but really otherwise, I I, I turn down gigs if people aren't free now, and I yeah. just because I feel now the pieces have all been written for this group and they've been written for the individuals as much as the band. Right. You know, the individuals make the sound. Yeah. And uh, the first album was. Uh, was a was an album of pieces, a mixture of pieces. This piece that we're going to hear was a piece that I wrote just before we recorded that album. But other pieces on the first album, August, some of them had been written, you know, 
several years. Tw I think one piece might have been written 20 years before. So it was a kind of a whole mixture of pieces that were written over a period of time. The second album then was pieces written in that in intervening time between the first recording, first album recording and the second. So again, very much about all the people, all those pieces were written for that band. And of course, even more so for the third album, which is this. I'm going to show you the third album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Short stories. I have and vinyl. It's on vinyl. We've got vinyl That's now. Vinyl. Yeah, and, and have... CDs. I've got the CD. Yeah, we did vinyl, and <laughs> vinyl as well for this one. And yeah. this is the al this is the album that we were touring last year, and that we will presumably be touring again. I'm I'm trying to get all these dates uh rescheduled and they hmm. they will be rescheduled we did have a sum in for march and april but i think they're going to be held over but yeah. we will be touring and all the dates will be on our below the fuse website or on uh, my website uh, alison rayner website um so yes hopefully we'll be able to go on and carry on because we've done a lot of lovely touring mostly in the uk we also did a tour of germany which was brilliant yeah. wasn't it that was great fun, yeah. Ten in days in Germany. In a wonderful van, wasn't it? Proper tour that was, in a van, all together, all in the van, having really some jollies. It. Yeah. <laughs> With my flashing lights, do you remember, on the way back after the gigs? Yeah. With, um, With disco lights hanging that from... That very the weird... We were in a sort of... In the middle of nowhere in Germany, <laughs> in farmland, trying to find this very dark, spooky house, driving back about half past one in the morning, then these country lanes, and it just went forever, didn't it? It just, yes, we were forever. driving for what felt like ages, and it just, it, this road wouldn't end, would it? It just kept going. We all got a bit hysterical, and then I started playing Thriller because it was quite spooky, wasn't it? Do you remember? We were, yeah. we were laughing in the, yeah, anyway, sorry. So, um, but good time. Have to be there, really. Yeah. But I like, it's fun. It's yeah. Um, yeah, we, this, this, yes, this track, uh, we were, so this this recording is uh, is from the Pizza Express, and we had our album launch in the end of February. Now, um, which year is it? This is I know February. it's mad, isn't it? I don't but I don't know where I am. Ago. Eleven months ago. You're right. So it's eleven months ago. So we had the album launch, which I viewed really as the it's sort of kicking off the second half of the tour because we've done the first half of the tour in the autumn. So this was. This was the London date for the subsequent um, touring around the UK to promote the album. And um, I, I just thought, oh, because you can record at the Pizza Express. And um, so I had a word with Luke there who, who does the sound. And he, I said, can we, go, can we do a sort of multi-camera proper recording? Because I thought it'd be great to have another video because we hadn't had a video for a little while. It's always good to have videos for... Um, promoters to see you know to decide if they want to book you and sometimes you have that awful thing where you record a video at a gig and it was not a very good gig or or nobody mm. came or something yeah, like that yeah. and, it, and it's disappointing yeah. but this was one of those occasions when everything yeah. coalesced we had a full house actually packed out yeah. um every, everybody played great it was a really yeah. great gig and that yeah. was wonderful because and great sound, yeah. Canceled. Yeah, really good sound. The gigs all got cancelled afterwards, but we at yeah. least had a nice video to show. And we yeah. did actually have got on our um, Blow the Fuse uh, YouTube page, we've got the whole gig, two yeah. sets. We showed the first set and then the second set uh, back in eight, uh, May, in May last year. Yeah. Um, but one thing I've noticed with, the, with this group as well is like, so, I mean, people may not realise this, that it, the whole thing's kind of generally back to front now with bands like. So the first thing you have to do is get a CD. So you end up recording an album of material that you haven't really played much to, in order to have a CD to then try and get some gigs with yep. to send to promoters. And so you end up, you know, and I've done it many times where you go in and you, you're, you're playing the stuff for the first time ever in the studio. And what's really nice about this is where we've had the bands been going for a long time. We've done a lot of gigs. We've played a lot together. And, we've, we, you know, by the time we get to this album, the third album, we were already playing this material on gigs. We toured it, you know, and we were it was hot, you know. And then, and then we went in the studio to record it, which is how they used to do it. That's, that's like the proper way of doing it, isn't it? But often you don't get the opportunity. And I felt like this third album was really great it really came out great because of that you know and um yeah and as you say you know and then we and then then we did the album launch and then we had all the whole tour which got pulled but we'd already done a few gigs on the material which i think it really makes a difference doesn't it 
And does. unfortunately, it's not common now. It's not not possible these days. I, I can't wait to get out on the road with Ark again, actually. I mean, and yeah. we will. I mean, I'm yeah. feeling yeah. sure we will. Just a, a few months and we'll be back out there again. So that's great. Yeah. Oh, the other thing we did, we played on Women's Hour, didn't we? Oh, yeah. We did that <laughs> Jenny Murray. Ago. Yeah. yeah, a year ago, you're right. That was a year ago in, I think it was January. It was just before this gig. I remember we all went up to the BBC, didn't we? And we played live. And that was, um, that was I fun. I did an interview, an interview with Jenny Murray, which was completely terrifying. <laughs> That's a lot of people heard that. That was great, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember we got some shortbread biscuits afterwards as well. Somebody bought some. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I remember that. That's the sort of thing that sticks in my mind. Um <laughs> well look it's been great uh, guys i really appreciate you coming on and it's so nice to sit down and talk about music and you know go through not only our stuff but all the stuff you've done before and to and hopefully people can get to taste of just the work that goes in you know the the dedication and the passion and that it takes to do this and to do it right and to do it properly and to keep doing it you know just to keep going it's it's an amazing achievement that you've that you've that you've done so much, um, not just for yourselves, for other people as well. And I think that's really special. So thank you. Thank you for everything you've done, all you do. And long, long, you know, long may you keep going and keep doing it. Thank you, Buster. It's been very, it's been fun. It's been nice. Yeah, nice to, to do the show. Yeah, thank you for inviting us on. Very, very nice of you. And, and I've enjoyed it as well. Thanks a lot. Great. Okay, folks. Well, um, we're going to play out with this now. And... Um, before I go, I'll just say next week of um, is Chris Batchelor, fantastic uh, trumpet player, very interesting musician, lots of interesting music we've got lined up for that. So don't forget. Also, tell your friends, um, sign up for the mailing list and you'll get the invite every week on a Friday. It comes out 7 o'clock, one hour before the show. Just uh, see the link. Oh, it's back. It's that side, isn't it? Pull back to front. There it is there, <laughs> down there. Uh, that That's the link. And if you have enjoyed the show, and uh, then do please consider making a little donation it really does um we really it does help a lot at the moment so and would be much appreciated so um thanks again thanks to everybody in the chat box lovely to see you all in there and we're going to play out now with um uh, thank you to Alison and Diz we're going to play out now with um half a world away which is which is a track which was from the first album which is called August um but this is a live recording of us playing um, at the Pizza Express in Soho in February 2020, and um, it was a, it was the album launch where we launched the third album, Short Stories. So uh, yeah, and do check out Blow the Fuse below for all the details and everything here. Thanks again. Bye everyone. See you next week. Thanks, Alison. Oh, Thanks, Disney. Thank Good night. Take care.